Well, uh, hola, ¿cómo están? Uh, buenas tardes a todos, uh, bienvenidos. Boa tarde a todos, sejam bem-vindos. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm going to chair this session. My name is Antonio Tadeu Gramis from the National Laboratory for Scientific Computing in Brazil. Uh, I will chair this session in English just to make this uniform, but uh, the, the participants are free to interact with us in Portuguese or in Spanish or in English and everything will be fine. So let's get uh, started in this, uh, in this uh, track HPC session two of the Latin America High Performance Computing Conference 2021, which is being organized brilliantly, organized by our colleagues from Guadalajara. So uh, to start, I'd like to invite uh, the speaker of our first paper, which is uh, DICE, Generic Data Abstraction for Enhancing the Convergence of HPC and Big Data, which is going to be presented by uh, Javier Garcia Blas. Javier, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, first of all. Thank you for the introduction. So let me share the, uh, the screen. To make a... Uh, uh, a small change here. So the second paper will be presented now. The paper is improving performance of long short-term memory networks for sentiment analysis using multi-core and GPU architectures uh, by Cristiano, uh, uh, Cristiano Cunas, Matheus Serpa, Edson Luiz Paduin, and Philippe Navo. Cristiano is going to present the paper. Cristiano, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Estão vendo? Yes. Ok. Uh, olá, então. Uh, meu nome é Cristiano e eu vou apresentar o trabalho Improving Performance of Long Short Term Memory Networks for Sentiment Analysis Using Multicore and GPU Architectures. Um breve sumário: produção, problema, trabalhos relacionados, implementação, resultados, conclusão, trabalhos futuros. O grande crescimento das mídias sociais tem despertado muito interesse na análise de sentimento. Ele é um dos campos de estudo mais ativos do processamento de linguagem natural. Saber a opinião de outros sobre algo foi muito importante para a maioria das pessoas durante uma tomada de decisão. Uh, entretanto, é, para muitas aplicações, nós não temos um algoritmo que realize a tarefa mas nós temos dados de exemplo, e esses dados, quando analisados, podem contribuir para uma tomada de decisão. Um modelo de rede neural artificial pode auxiliar na extração automática do sentimento dessas opiniões. O problema que, que encontramos é que uh, é impossível para qualquer ser humano uh, analisar grande quantidade de dados em pouco tempo, e ainda mais difícil compreender como as pessoas se sentem em relação a produtos e ou serviços, porque somente alguns pontos de um texto de opinião são relevantes. Ou seja, para definir se uma avaliação é boa ou não, é preciso identificar sobre quem se fala e o que está sendo falado. E, além disso, dependendo da quantidade de dados, pode levar muito tempo para, para fazer essa análise. Trabalhos relacionados, então, a análise de sentimento é um tema essencial para diferentes empresas, pois ajuda a identificar a opinião e entender as respostas das pessoas aos novos conteúdos, fornecendo insights do público, que auxiliam na tomada de decisões. Nesse contexto, várias abordagens são exploradas. A maioria das propostas se concentra na precisão dos modelos Long Short Term Memory para análise de sentimento. Diferentemente, nós avaliamos o desempenho de treinamento desses modelos, aumentando o tamanho do batch, usando arquiteturas multicore e GPU. A implementação do modelo uh, se deu a partir da linguagem de programação Python, utilizando o framework Keras para modelagem, com a biblioteca TensorFlow como biblioteca numérica de back-end. Utilizamos o IMDB Movie Review Dataset, 
uma coleção com 50 mil avaliações, com um número par de análises positivas e negativas, pré-processamos os dados, isso se faz necessário para remover o ruído presente nas sentenças e codificar os textos de maneira que seja possível usá-los no treinamento da rede. Então, para isso, removemos caracteres especiais e sinais de pontuação e transformamos todas as palavras em letras minúsculas. Também removemos as stop words, que são palavras que não agregam significado. Consideramos apenas as 300 primeiras palavras de cada review, a fim de padronizar, e mantemos um máximo de 20 mil palavras no vocabulário. Então, usamos o site learning para dividir o conjunto de dados em trem, 80%, e teste, 20%. Essa figura representa a arquitetura do modelo, simulada no TensorBoard, uma ferramenta do TensorFlow. O modelo conta com um total de seis camadas, uma camada de entrada com o tamanho das sequências, uma camada em bag com o tamanho do vocabulário, uma camada long short term memory com 128 unidades e um dropout de 20%. Uh, ou seja, nós descartamos 20% das unidades na transformação linear das entradas, fazendo com que os neurônios restantes aprendam maneiras de suprimir a ausência dos outros. Isso cria um sistema de redundância. Uh, duas camadas densas, utilizando a função de ativação RELU, a primeira com 128 unidades e a segunda com 64. Por fim, uma camada densa de saída, com a função de ativação sigmoide, que ajusta a saída entre 0 e 1, resultando em uma única saída. Compilamos o um modelo com a função de loss Binary Cross Entropy e o otimizador Adam. Então, nós treinamos o um modelo com cinco épocas. Vale ressaltar que, na fase de treinamento, ainda separamos 20% dos dados de treinamento para validação a cada época. Ou seja, dos 80% inicialmente separados para o treino, ainda reservamos uma parte desse para validar ao final de cada época. O ambiente de execução então, é composto por uma máquina local, um sistema Linux Ubuntu 18.04, kernel 4.15, processador Intel Core i7, frequência 2.60 GHz, 6 núcleos físicos e 12 threads, 16 de memória RAM e uma uh, GPU NVIDIA GTX 2060, 6 GB de memória, 1920 CUDA cores e o compilador uh, utilizado NVCC 10.0.130. Como resultado, então, essa primeira figura a, apresenta a curaça no conjunto de dados de treinamento, com 40 mil registros, uh, com diferentes tamanhos de batch, nas execuções tanto em multicore quanto em GPU. Dá para perceber que conforme aumenta o número de instâncias para cada atualização do, do gradiente, a precisão do modelo é reduzida. Entretanto, ela se mantém acima de 90%. Esta segunda figura uh, apresenta a curaça no conjunto de dados de validação, novamente variando o tamanho do batch, uh, e executando tanto em multicore quanto em GPU. Essa métrica ela pode ser considerada a mais importante, pois ela informa o percentual que nosso modelo acertou na predição em relação ao ROC. Uh, ou seja, a partir de cada novo registro do conjunto de dados, uh, para quantos o modelo foi capaz de definir o ROC correto. Nos nossos experimentos, nota-se que a curaça se mantém estável, entre 87% e 89%. Já nessa figura, uh, apresentamos os tempos de treinamento de cada modelo, conforme o tamanho do batch definido. Percebe-se que conforme aumenta o tamanho, o tempo de execução é reduzido consideravelmente em ambas as arquiteturas. As execuções em multicore apresentaram um ganho de 3,17 vezes, reduzindo o tempo de 1.066 segundos para 336 segundos. Uh, nas execuções em GPU, o ganho chegou a 12,15 vezes, reduzindo de 2.098 segundos para 172 segundos, que representa um ganho de 91%. O ganho é bem expressivo quando comparado a, a multicore, entretanto, é, com o batch menor, é possível perceber que o tempo de execução em GPU aumentou substancialmente em relação ao tempo multicore. Isso ocorre pelo fato de a GPU levar mais tempo para a transferência dos dados do que para o treinamento em si. Quando o número de instâncias aumenta, então a gente consegue utilizar mais da capacidade que a GPU oferece. 
ainda nessa mesma nesse mesmo gráfico o speedup é apresentado o speedup da GPU tem demonstrado uh, apresentado seu melhor caso no treinamento com batch size em 2024 uh, isso equivale a um ganho de 2.61 vezes sobre a arquitetura multicore por fim como forma de validar nós selecionamos um modelo dos treinados e implantamos uh, o gráfico uh, à esquerda apresenta as métricas do modelo selecionado, com acurácia de 88%. Nós coletamos uh, 10 reviews aleatórios da página oficial do IMDB, que foram submetidas como entrada para o modelo treinado. A tabela apresenta os valores que foram obtidos como saída. A primeira coluna é apenas um identificador. Uh, a segunda coluna é a avaliação uh, em quantidade de estrelas que o autor deu no momento da, da avaliação. E então, nós pegamos o texto do review e submetemos ao modelo, que nos retornou a classe predita e o percentual. Nós consideramos o valor de 1 a 5 estrelas como uh, uma opinião negativa e entre 6 e 10 como uma opinião positiva. Então, é possível perceber que o modelo foi assertivo em todos os casos submetidos. Para concluir, então, nós implementamos e usamos o um modelo de rede neural recorrente com LSTM. Uh, avaliamos o desempenho de treinamento para diferentes tamanhos de batch em arquiteturas multicore e GPU. Uh, nós alcançamos ganho de até 3,17 vezes em multicore, com um aumento de batch, e de até 12,15 vezes em GPU. Comparando as arquiteturas, nós conseguimos reduzir o tempo de treinamento em até 61%, sem interferir na acurácia, e isso representa um speedup de 2.61 vezes no melhor caso. Como trabalhos futuros, então, a primeira iniciativa uh, pode ser o uso de Word Embedding pré-treinados, uh, também avaliar outros conjuntos de dados em outros idiomas, que esse do IMDB é em inglês, então uh, eu pretendo utilizar o em português também, e de outras fontes, como, por exemplo, o Twitter. Uma outra abordagem a ser estudada é uma melhor separação do conjunto de dados em treinamento, validação e teste. Alguns agradecimentos, então, à Petrobras, ao projeto Green Cloud, da Papel de CNPq e à Capes, pelo suporte. Muito obrigado. Obrigado, Cristiano, pela sua apresentação. Agradeço também o cuidado com o tempo, né? Temos aí um tempo razoável aí para perguntas. Então, eu abro para a plateia. Elas pode, as pessoas podem fazer... Bom, let, let me switch to English to make it uniform to, to our Spanish friends. Uh, so, guys, you can write your questions on the chat or if you prefer... You can also ask me to to unmute your micro, microphone so that you can make your your question. So people seem to to be a little bit shy. That's all right. Well, in, in fact, uh, well, I'll make the, the question in Portuguese. Uh, então, Cristiano, é muito interessante o, o seu trabalho. E, em particular, né, chama a atenção o fato... Bom, há um fato que é esperado, né, de que as GPUs acelerariam o processo, é o que todo mundo, em tese, espera, mas é interessante observar também que isso não vem de graça e não vem sempre, né, como foi o gráfico que você mostrou. Ah, uma dúvida que eu fiquei com relação aos teus experimentos é com relação à, à precisão é, utilizada vocês, é, para fins de, de configuração do, do, do TensorFlow, vocês ah, usaram é, alguma diferenciação de precisão, de precisão simples, precisão dupla, ou simplesmente usaram o que é o default da biblioteca? O default, default. Tá, que eu acho que é precisão simples, né? Você sabe? Eu acho que sim. Não, não, não posso confirmar, mas eu acredito que sim, seja simples. Uhum. A joia. Deixa eu ver o chat se tem mais alguma pergunta. Bom, é, não tem não. Então, é, Cristiano, 
quero te agradecer aí pela pela excelente apresentação e pelo trabalho seu e, e do grupo. Ok? Obrigado. Muito obrigado. Obrigado. Uh, our next paper would be, in fact, the one that was the first one, which is DICE. Javier, are you ready? And uh, yes, uh, totally. Great. So if you be so kind, great. That's it. So uh, the floor is yours whenever you want to start. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, welcome uh, to this presentation and thank you for the introduction. So um, I, I will uh, present uh, uh, our solution that is called uh, DISA. So this is uh, uh, the content of the uh, of this uh, talk. I will start with the introduction and the motivation of this uh, work. So uh, we know that uh, nowadays uh, most of the high performance computing applications uh, use the POSIX uh, standard for uh, getting access uh, to data just for reading and, and, and writing. However, uh, using uh, the system, uh, can arrange multiple uh, problems uh, that are uh, things like, uh, for example, handling the complex data structures. For example, if we have to deal with a complex uh, data format or the complex uh, data organizations. The other problem that we detected is that uh, we have a completely lack of control over the file system parameters like uh, optimizations or uh, tuning parameters. And of, of course, the other problem is that uh, we have a really high dependency between the operating system data layers. So um, given these problems, uh, problems uh, we have to, to cope with this uh, challenge by uh, proposing uh, a new uh, interface for uh, increasing the productivity when we uh, want to implement application for both uh, high performance computing and uh, big data domains. So uh, for that, the objective of this work is just to present the design and the implementation of a data container-based solution for uh, applications that uh, require a lot of uh, data uh, movements, like uh, the classical and new uh, data, data intensive applications. So uh, for that, uh, our goal is just to offer a high-level programming inter interface uh, for uh, joining the good things for uh, HPC and the big data domains, and also uh, a solution for exploiting uh, the optimization levels of uh, different process uh, interface uh, backends. So uh, our solution is just a, a new uh, data model that is based on, on plugins that uh, assist users for the uh, for using uh, different storage systems. So I, I will see later that we, we can only support uh, file systems like POSIX or uh, ESFS in case of having uh, big data-like applications. And our solutions present different optimizations. Uh, the first one is uh, we have a really intelligent memory uh, management uh, based on C++. Uh, the, the idea is, uh, we uh, try as much as possible to reduce uh, data copies in the in the hierarchical uh, code organizations. So for that, uh, we use and we exploit the move operators of C++ programming language. Uh, the other advantage of our uh, system is that it's completely uh, implemented using a template uh, based generic programming. Uh, this uh, facilitates a lot the implementation of uh, new plugins that can be uh, included in the in the system, and also as uh, you can uh, see in the in the, in the paper, uh, we have integrated in our uh, data model a solution for uh, for eliminating the uh, the interferences when we have uh, multiple applications running uh, in the same time. So our, our solution is uh, is based on data containers. Uh, these data containers offers a high level abstraction uh, with the aim of having the complexity when we have to deal with different uh, story systems. 
So in, in many cases, for example, we have to deal with uh, file systems like ESFS, uh, POSIX, and, uh, and so on. So the, the idea is just to uh, simplify as much as possible the, the implementation tasks of developers by offering uh, a common and a standard way to get in access. So we offer different uh, types of data containers. Uh, firstly, depending on the use, uh, we can uh, uh, support input and output data containers. And also depending on the, the data types, we support a binary and text files. So in this uh, figure, uh, we have uh, the way that we uh, address these uh, plugin systems uh, as done in other uh, IO interfaces like uh, Romeo in, in MPI. Uh, firstly, uh, we uh, specify which file system we want to use. Uh, for example, in this case, ESFS. And also we support the data set or the collection path that we want to address. So firstly, let me just do the tell in which way support uh, input uh, containers. Uh, we uh, provide this instruction for getting data from the uh, backend storage system. And uh, depending on the cardinality, uh, we, uh, we introduce two kinds of containers. We have collections and we have a data set. Uh, independently of the container, the, the key point of uh, input containers is that we offer an iterator-based access scheme. Uh, in, in some minutes, I, I will show you one a real sample with a use case in where uh, we can iterate over these uh, collections uh, and, and data sets. But the idea is uh, we offer different kind of iterators for getting access to different level of the uh, file uh, hierarchy. So in, in some cases, it's possible to get access to, to files directly in a, like, in a traditional way but also it's possible to get access to that data items. For example, uh, in case of a text file, it could be a, a single line of, uh, of the file. Uh, regarding the output containers, the DI is just to, 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 of course, to simplify in which way we can uh, store the results in the final uh, backend. Uh, for that, we uh, introduce another abstraction that is called the fraser. Uh, and the fraser is in charge of writing data uh, to the uh, final file system. Uh, thanks to the fraser, it's possible to, uh, to uh, create new instances of files. And, uh, in, and it's really, really simple to, to write these files because it's not needed to use the traditional POSIX-like uh, interface. One of the optimizations that we apply at this level is just to uh, remove the internal copies when uh, we have uh, different buffers at different levels of the of the uh, code. So for for that reason, we use uh, the uh, move uh, uh, policy of C++ with the idea uh, of uh, maintaining in memory just one single copy of of the data every time we create a new file. Uh, right now, uh, okay, the code is available as you can see in the uh, in the paper. So it's in a GIC repository, and currently we are supporting a different file system thanks to our uh, plugin system. So currently we support three uh, main file systems. Uh, the first one is uh, ESFS, uh, just for supporting uh, big data applications. Uh, we, of course, we support supports, uh, we support POSIX and also IMSS, that is uh, an internal um, uh, in-memory storage system that we uh, presented in other in other paper in the past. So just let me just introduce um, a use case uh, in where we can use uh, the uh, containers. Uh, in this use case, the idea is a simple piece of code uh, in, in where we count how many hashtags we can find in, in a Twitter, in a Twitch collection. So as you can see for first, in the first two lines, uh, we create uh, two containers, one for uh, reading, another for writing. Um, of course, we define the path uh, where the data is. And of course, we specify the file system that we want to uh, target. In additional, 
Uh, in addition, it is possible to specify the, the line separator in case of uh, text files. By default, is the, the, the new line, but in this case, I saw you that it's possible to, uh, to change this value with the spaces or other uh, symbols. And of course, uh, the fraser is just the path in where we want to put the, uh, the results. Uh, in the following line, uh, we define a regular expression just for uh, recognizing the hashtag symbol in every uh, word. And uh, finally, uh, what we have here is this uh, loop. Uh, this loop corresponds with an iterator. And as you can see here, independently of the number of files, the, the file system where uh, the files are stored, we uh, get line per line and we can process the line independently. Uh, without using a specific uh, IO interface. Just for concluding this example, uh, in, in this case for writing the results in, in the final backend, what we do is just we create a new file. And uh, again, we use uh, C++, C++ uh, IO strings for uh, writing the results in, in, in a text file. Okay, so uh, at the end idea of this code is of this code is that we we want to reduce as much as possible the number of lines of code that developers need uh, to introduce for implementing this kind of uh, applications. We have uh, evaluated the overhead of our system comparing with a uh, base lane. Uh, so uh, as you see in these slides, we are uh, comparing. Uh, two file systems. Uh, on the left, you have uh, the uh, aggregated execution time of the previous use case uh, using uh, ESFS. Uh, uh, on, on the right, you have uh, the same evaluation, but in this case, uh, testing uh, or DC with a cluster file system. In this case, the interface is uh, purely uh, POSIX. Uh, as you can see in, in both uh, plots, uh, we compared uh, an increase in data size uh, from uh, 10 gigabytes to mostly 60 uh, gigabytes. And as we appreciate, uh, we see that the overhead is, is really small. Is in, in this case, when we have really big data sets, the overhead is uh, close to, to 1-2% uh, for both uh, ESFS and, and cluster uh, file system. Other uh, uh, evaluation, uh, other experimental evaluation that we did uh, was just to uh, to copy data from uh, one file system to to other uh, using uh, this and uh, using the uh, native interface of uh, POSIX or ESFS. Uh, in the first graph here uh, on on the left. Uh, we uh, compared the execution uh, time of copying different uh, data set from a cluster file system to SDFS. Uh, we observe here that uh, depending on the uh, data size of the input and output data, uh, we have uh, simply small differences when we uh, have uh, small uh, files and, and big files. This uh, effect is even more clear in, in case of uh, moving data from ESFS to Gluster. Uh, we observed that our solution uh, clearly outperforms uh, the native solution. Uh, this is because uh, our solution invokes the Java virtual machine just once, while uh, if we repeat this process with several files uh, using the, the native uh, command line uh, commands from Hadoop file system, we have to uh, create multiple times uh, virtual machines in Java. And of course, this is a really um, uh, costly task. So uh, we observe that we're, our uh, solution, when we are moving from uh, ASFS to, to plaster file system, or system or is actually better. Just uh, for uh, concluding, uh, we have presented uh, this. Uh, uh, the idea of this uh, is just uh, to to uh, to join the efforts of the HPC and Big Data community, just offering a single uh, interface for getting uh, access. Uh, we uh, use modern C++ features uh, for implementing a generic uh, solution based on templates. Uh, we apply different um, 
uh, optimizations like uh, C++ uh, move operators for removing copies in internal hierarchy. And uh, uh, given the, the, the results uh, from the uh, experimental evaluation, we have demonstrated that uh, our solution uh, is uh, feasible for both HPC and uh, big data uh, storage systems. So this is uh, a list of the three projects that uh, support uh, this uh, this paper. And OK, this is all uh, for me. Uh, thank you. Gracias, Javier. Uh, I will open uh, the floor for questions. And uh, I'm glad to see that there is a, already one here. Uh, so it's Aurelio Vivas who is asking. When using the, the DICE or GIS, uh, I don't know what's the correct, uh, when using the DICE API, how is the data being presented to the programmer? Matrices, arrays, files? Uh, uh, yes, uh, it's a really good question. So uh, as I said before, we support two kinds of uh, files. We support uh, binary files as well, also text files. So uh, in case of having uh, uh, to, to deal with matrices arise or these kind of things, of course, uh, these, the data should be stored in binary. And of course, we need another extra layer for representing this data to the final users. So uh, right now we mostly focus on text files, but okay, the, uh, we have a pre-million pre initial version uh, supporting binary files. But of course, we need an extra layer for um, representing uh, these kind of things. Okay, thank you, Javier. Uh, I, I indeed have a, a question. Uh, well, clear, clearly the design was based on, on, on some C++ constructs, which which very fine, very nice. I mean, uh, I'm a C++ programmer, so I like to see these uh, solutions available. But is it, uh, is it correct to say that the, the general abstraction that you, were, uh, that you are defining is, on, is specific to C++? I mean, if I have a, a solver in, in Fortran, for instance, could, uh, could I be able to, to use this, uh, this system? Mm, unfortunately, no. Uh, so we are uh, using C++, C++ and uh, in case of using other uh, primary languages, we need a kind of wrapper for supporting that. So currently, one of my students is working on a Python-like interface for supporting that. But of course, you need a, a wrapper. Yeah, I imagine. Okay, uh, Javier, thank you very much for your presentation. Let's go uh, straight to the third one, which is uh, OCFTL, an MPI implementation independent fault tolerance library for task-based applications from Pedro Henrique Rosso and uh, Emilio Franceschini. So I'd like to invite Pedro, who is already there. Great. So Pedro, the floor is yours. So thank you. Uh... My name is Pedro Henrique de Francisco. So I'll be presenting on CFTL, an implementa MPI implementation independent fault tolerance library for test classic applications. So in this presentation, I will be starting with a small introduction about the subject, and then I will present the, the library itself, then the experiments we did, and finally the conclusions of the work. So uh, this work concerns fault tolerance for HPC, and since we are working with a large number of nodes, uh, the frequency of failures is uh, is increased. And for example, in the Titan supercomputer, we have a mean time between failures of only seven hours. Uh, to deal with the, the, this problem, uh, concerning fault tolerance for MPI, which is the subject of this work, uh, we'll be facing mainly the WellFM work, which, which is what can see, what can say the, the biggest effort in fault tolerance for MPI proposing a, a chapter for uh, fault tolerance in the MPI standard. But today it is still relies on OpenPI, a specific MPI implementation. Uh, we'll be looking to, to in the MPI CH 
which has uh, limited faultiness uh, tools, or other approaches that are abandoned or migrated to other projects. Or we'll be facing manual solutions by the, the applications programmers, which can be a, a difficult test, especially if the, the program is, is not from the, the computing eye. So uh, this work is included in the OMP cluster project. Uh, this project is a project that uh, uses the parallelization of applications in HPC using OpenMP plus MPI, resulting in a task-based applications. So the main, the main contribution of this work is the uh, portable user library, uh, meaning uh, a library that can be used for uh, any MPI standard compliance uh, implementation. Uh, and improve the failure detection and propagation me mechanisms. So uh, here uh, I bring a, a small example of how things, do, things work in OMP cluster, just to better understand this, this work. And from a, a simple program, uh, parallelize it with uh, OpenMP. Uh, a direct acyclic graph will be generated con containing the tasks that were uh, generated during the the, the parallelization with OpenMP. And these tasks will be then uh, scheduled by the OpenMP, OMP cluster, and then will be distributed to, uh, in a distributed system uh, through the MPI. And the, the, lib the library uh, of autonomous will, will be implemented in this uh, level of the, the OMP cluster. So talking about the, the, libra the library, uh, we first have the failure detection and propagation mechanisms. So to detect failures, we'll be using the, the heartbeat uh, proposed by the WellFM, where we, we have a, a ring topology, where each process observes uh, other process and also sends a bit to other process. So if you, anytime a process uh, stops sending bits during some time to, to, the, to its observer, uh, this observer will be detecting that the, that process uh, failed. So, will be rearranging the, the, the ring, uh, removing that failure process from the, from the ring. So the first thing we propose is a false positive detection. So if any time this process that failed, uh, starts sending back in, uh, the bits to, the, to its previous observer, uh, this process will be uh, stating that this previous failed process uh, was a false positive failure, and we'll be adding again the, this process to the ring. In this case, this example, uh, turning back to the original ring. So the second thing we propose is the shuffling of initial positions. So supposing we have uh, this 18 pair process uh, distributed in three nodes, the blue, the green, the, the red. Uh, if it these processes are sequential on the ring and are in the same node. Uh, if this blue node fails, it means that these three processes will fail. So it will be the responsibility of three, detecting that the first two failed, then we'll be observing that one failed, and after some time detecting that this process failed too, and more time to detect the process zero failed too. So we have this delay in the detection of these three failures. Uh, if you simple shuffle this position, uh, the probability of these processes that are in the same node uh, being uh, sequential on the heartbeat ring uh, is reduced. So in this example, uh, we have if the blue, blue node fails, meaning 0, 1, 2 fail, uh, the, the process 3, 7, and 4 will detect at the same time that the process 0, 1, and 2 fail. So we uh, do not have the node delay to detect all the failures. The, the third thing we propose is the chord light broadcast. Here we use the idea of the chord to, uh, to request a key from a distributed system that uses the power of two, uh, but to choose uh, which process will be sending the broadcast. So in this example, uh, if a zero starts a broadcast, we'll be looking at 210, 201, 202, and so on. Uh, and we'll be sending uh, each round for each process that is doing the broadcast a message from, from to those nodes, those, those processes. So each time uh, a process receives the first message of a broadcast, it, it will replicate uh, 
uh, this broadcast one time. So in this example, on round one, zero sent to one, two, and four. And in round one, one is will be sent into two, three, and five. Two will be sent to three, four, and six, and so on. And what you can see here is uh, each process at the end of the broadcast will be receiving uh, redundant messages, which, which is intended for uh, fault awareness. So to handle failures in the system, we propose the use of checkpointing, where, use, where we leverage the lock library to the lock library to save and load the checkpoints. Uh, speci specifically in the process of restarting, uh, instead of restarting the entire application from the last saved checkpoint, we'll be restarting only the tasks that has any kind of relation to the task that failed. So in this example, the task 17 failed, and we'll be restarting, restarting these five tasks uh, instead of re execu executing the entire uh, tasks from the last checkpoint. So, uh, of course, we will not be restarting the tasks that are already saved or not executed yet. Uh, we also propose the use of wrappers. Uh, wrappers are used here to uh, intercept MPI functions. So uh, we can do a pair processing before then, especially uh, to check if the other side of the communication is alive to avoid some uh, dead logs, for example. If you are using an MPI receive operation and waiting for a process, wait for a message from a process that died, we'll be waiting forever in that, uh, that occasion. So using wrappers permits us to verify if that process we are waiting the message, for example, is alive or not. Uh, we also propose the communicator sharing cache. This is a procedure where we reduce the communicator to a new communicator where only the process that are, are alive are, they contain only the process that are, are alive. So this is useful for collective operations. Since you are, if we do a collective operation with a dead process inside a communicator, that can be a problem. We also propose a notification system to make the uh, photons events of OCFTL available to the, the application. And we also propose the get any states functions that are functions that return the current state of any process, if it's alive or not, and the state of the communicator if it has any process dying in, in, in there. Uh, to evaluate this, this uh, lib library, we use the sense of the most per computer and we evaluate at the MPI CH and on the OpenPI testing delivery. And uh, also we use the WellFM to compare the results. Uh, we, for the confidence interval, we use the bootstrapping technique so, since you, we are working with a small number of samples. The first thing we evaluated is the behavior of the implementations. What, can see, what we can observe here is for different MPI implementations and uh, for different operations, uh, with two processes. Uh, what we evaluate here is, is not the correctness of the, the, the operation with failures, but if the program uh, continues or times out because a uh, poss possible deadlock. So for MPI stage and WellFM, we can see that a few, with a few exceptions, almost all of the, the operations, uh, the program finished, but for the OpenPI, we can see a timeout in the majority of the, the applications. So this shows the importance of working with your wrappers uh, to avoid these possible uh, deadlocks that can occur in the, the, the MPI operations when uh, using these operations with filed nodes. Uh, we also did the empirical evaluation of delivery using the Intel MPI benchmarks. Uh, using a total of 408 process, uh, where we evaluated uh, collective and point-to-point -point operations for different uh, MPI implementations and configurations, uh, comparing any uh, for each one uh, the use of delivery over the use the normal use uh, without delivery. Uh, for the OFM using the WellFM Photonest tools over WellFM without the Photonest tools. 
Uh, we can observe that is uh, for the collective benchmarks, we have a, a lot of overhead except for uh, OpenPI, while for the point-to-point, -point, we have uh, overhead, significant overhead only on, in the MPH uh, implementation. So if you look only at the overhead, uh, our best solution here is the using the library, the library with OpenPI, but uh, we think, uh, I think we cannot see here, but is important is the total time to complete the, the benchmarks, uh, where if you look at, at the, the results, the MPH was the, the better option than Open, OpenPI, for example. So we can conclude here that this, uh, the portability of choosing where MPI implementation we are using can uh, sometimes overcome the, the overhead the library has. Uh, we also evaluate the propagation local delay. So for the, the propagation, we are uh, comparing, comparing the, the broadcast. Uh, we compare the cord, uh, our proposal with the BMG and the HBA, if you are using in the OLFM. Uh, for performance, we have about the same results for ever for any of them. But when you look at the number of messages spent to, to do the broadcast, uh, we have at least 30% of uh, reducing the messages from using the, the cord like broadcast. For local to delay, uh, we, here, we simulated here two scenarios. The first is for random failures, meaning uh, failures in process that are not in the same node, and sequential failures, meaning the process that are in the same node, uh, meaning uh, failures of nodes. Uh, so comparing the shuffle options with the standard two option, we can see for the, the first scenario, we have about the same result, but for this, the second scenario, uh, we have the shuffle uh, option uh, showing better results. So in the paper, we find more information about the limitations of delivery, the standalone use, and the, the more details about the, the library tools. Uh, concluding, we have uh, proposed a library that the library that is easy to maintain, since, since it works only if uh, the MPI standard functions, and uh, a library that is transparent to the final user of the OMP cluster. Uh, proposing different FT approaches, you know, checkpointing, uh, communicator shrinkage, wrappers, uh, a library that is portable, and as results, we can see that we can avoid the locks. Uh, sometimes the portability of the, the, the library overcomes the overhead. And for the broadcast, we reduce the number of messages and improve the fault lens detection, the delay for uh, sequential failures. For future work, we are working on optimizing checkpoints, looking at the failed workers and other FT approaches. Uh, we also thank you to the, the supporters of this work and my uh, presentation ends here. Thank you all. Thanks a lot, Pedro. Very nice and interesting uh, project. I will just check the, the chat if there is uh, any question. Yes, Esteban, go ahead. Do you want the mic? I, I think I can ahead. access the mic, yeah. Okay, thank you, Antonio. Um, yeah, Pedro, one, one question. Uh, I understand your library uh, works with any MPI implementation, and uh, you showed us a plot with the overhead of a couple of benchmarks, I think. Yeah, if you go that one. Uh, can you explain why the uh, overhead ranges so much between the different the different MPI implementations. Why is that we have open MPI say with little overhead and MPH with a high with a high overhead? Uh, I think the the this is major because of the 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 time to execute the the benchmarks itself. So for example, I, I don't have the, the data here, but uh, for some of these benchmarks, MPI executed in like uh, 200 uh, milliseconds, while MPH executed in much less 
time. So uh, uh, I think the majority of the, the the overhead comes because of the low low time execution of the the, the library, the the benchmarks. Oh, okay, I see. I see. Did you, did you guys try to run say no, not just kernels like like a non reduce or a ping pong, but maybe mini apps? Uh, I don't know, like mini MD or, or or like a small code, but that that resembles like a real application. Uh, we no, we didn't execute uh, in our benchmarks. We executed uh, benchmark using the the test bench version of uh, OMP cluster where I have here. Let me show. Uh, extra slide. Uh, we execute the task bench uh, benchmarks. Uh, in fact, uh, are not a uh, real application, but uh, simulates the some some things in real applications where we see uh, the li the libraries show no much overhead. You, this is using OMP cluster runtime over OMP cluster runtime of CFTL. And these are outliers, but uh, we uh, talking about the the other applications. Uh, it's very hard for us to. Uh, it was uh, very hard for us to test our applications. We since we are intended to work with the checkpoint evaluating checkpoint in two, and the, it's still uh, what we looking for now in the future projects that are evaluating if uh, we don't use uh, libre, this libre, meaning the use of, with uh, other uh, applications, like you say. Yes, thank you so much. Well, uh, so I'd like to thank you, Federica. Uh, I, I don't think we have uh, other questions? Oh, yes. No, it's a message from Esteban. Uh, so, okay, I'd like to thank you, Pedro Henrique, for your nice presentation, really uh, nice work. And uh, I will go straight to the following uh, paper, uh, which is actually from the same group. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to invite uh, Francisco, for getting ready for this presentation. Francisco, the floor is yours. Hi, my name is Francisco Alisson Rocha. I am a master's student at the University of Sao Paulo. I am part of the InterCity project. And today I come to present the work, Accelerate Smart City Simulation. Our group is composed by me, Fukuda, Franceschini, and Cordero. This work is inserted within the context of urban mobility. And our object of his study is a uh, urban traffic simulation using InterSimulator. The InterSimulator is a simulator of the InterCity project. The InterCity project is a uh, project of smart series. And due to some limitation present by InterSimulator, such as excessive use of memory, CPU usage limited to 50%, and bad distribution of tasks in distributed memory, we propose a two-level approach to accelerate the inter-simulate. Um, this first approach is an approach high level, the CIMEDAP. We propose a inspiration approach from simulation points. And due to the large amount of time spent running harder simulations, and Hamlet proposed the simulation points. And in, initially, we use it to speed up harder simulations. And with the idea of taking advantage of the periodicity of metrics related to the number of times uh, basic block of code are executed, uh, where SimPoint uses the recurrence of metric patterns during the execution of the application. This execution is segmented in basic block intervals. And these intervals are represented by basic block vectors. And this, these basic block vectors are then compared and grouped by the similarity in clusters using the uh, algorithm then such as k-means with Manhattan distance. And 
<clears throat> then the representative of each class are selected and assign weights to each one, and only the representatives are executed. Uh, thus, with the weights and representatives, we we are able to estimate the rest of the simulation without without the need to uh, the full sim uh, the need to run the full simulation. And our case. Uh, I feel the challenge of simulating large simulation like the one in the city of Sao Paulo. Our proposed technique is called uh, simulation estimation by data patterns exploration, SIMEDAP, an approach inspired by simulation points. And we will modify simu sim simulation points to create a new technique to speed up smart city simulations. And we were using the recurrence of traffic flow behaviors patterns in the streets and transforming them into time series. In our work, we use a K-shape. We shape a basic distance to compare uh, time series. And the simulation point in CIMEDAP is not an interval of basic code block blocks, and, but a time series that represented the flow of the vehicles on uh, street in a uh, given the time interval. Uh, in addition, we are not going to assign weights to the clusters. We carry out in, to the temporal mapping of the simulation points to the other time series in the clusters, and we distort the simulation point in time to estimate the other time series. In red, we have an illustration, illustration of a simulation point mapped uh, point to point uh, to series of the of your clusters in in blue and we use uh, this summary mapping to transform into uh, from the new uh, the same point into other series in the cluster uh, distorting in the time and again we don't need to to run the complete simulation only parts of each a uh, sample of streets that will allow the extraction of simulation points from the new simulation that corresponded to the previous one. Uh, about the results of CIMEDAP, the first experiment, uh, we showed the accuracy of our technique to estimate of the series from the sim simulation points. And here we show the original time series and the time the time series obtained from the simulation point of the class of this time series. Uh, the average error for the estimation of complete simulation uh, is less than six times the ratio to minus six. And the second experiment, the, uh, the second experiment consider inclusion of new traffic lights in 11% of the streets. And create a new center from the original center and and to estimation of metrics from uh, the use of previous simulation uh, the original simulation uh, estimation of metrics in the new simulation uh, without to the need to run the complete simulation um, met, uh, metrics such as average speed uh, average of uh, vehicles uh, on in the street and uh, percent of street occupancy rate and the other metrics uh, related to uh, smart city simulations. And for average speed metric, we have the maximum error of two uh, doctor five percent, and for occupancy rate, a uh, low error of thirty five percent. And the percent of errors may vary by scenery. And here we show uh, the time spent in each step of, of the execution of CIMEDAP in, in the last experiment. And the step that can take the most time are closely in open path, but they are only performing once. And so apply CIMEDAP running a partial simulation. We saving time is in our cases. And so we were able to speed up on, on partial runs of the new simulation. About the second approach, an approach low level, we perform a profile to identify possible bottlenecks 
and on the application level profile, the tool of choice was Linux Path. Linux Path has low overhead and easy, easily usable plug and play. About the results of the profile, our application level profile detected performs degradation on functions really on multi-process synchronization using the Erlang ZTS data structures. About the synchronization, we spent 25 percent execution and about ETS tables spent six percent execution time. Uh, our profile and analysis demonstrated that an uh, important portion of the execution time was spent in uh, Erlang ETS tables. We set out to improve the Erlang term storage. It allows for multi table, uh, thread safe, and search on very few and in a size of purple. And the most used DTS table throughout the simulation was the Lisi Street table. It keeps track of our simulation streets and, and they start the like maximum speed and current capacity. And you, what is it necessary uh, to implement it for Lisi Street table in our case? is one table, thread safety, and search, search uh, key field, and fixed size, size structure. And about the optimization for, uh, <clears throat> from uh, to low approach, and uh, the three optimization of MTC simulator were performed. The, uh, the first optimization was a custom storage library uh, made using Erlang native implementing functions. Uh, the second optimization is creating uh, our, our, our bitching function was another attempt to get even closer to the virtual machine and work around the problems. And the last optimization is updating version of Erlang OTP uh, of 20 version to 24 version. About the results for a low level approach, and native implementing functions with the, with the implementation of, we had again, 20% performance uh, on micro benchmarks and 28% performance on execution of the <clears throat> inter-simulator ISCS. And the second optimization is uh, built-in functions. Uh, we, with the implementation of, we had again, 20% uh, performance in micro branch max. And in addition to gains from implementation, we also gained from upgrading Erlang OTP to version 24 and of 100% to 300% performance in this update. Uh, to complete, um, this work showed a method for accelerating the simulation using Knowledge I created from previous simulations inspired by simulation points. And the estimation of the SAM simulation using CMEDAP present a uh, great result uh, with a variation error uh, is less than six times uh, 10 raised to minus six. And using CMEDAP showed good results in estimate metrics for new simulations uh, similar to the original and about the Second approach, an approach low level, never implement functions show the visible performance improvement and performance gains through GIT compile used in Erlang OTP uh, after update to version 24. And the future work is uh, the, the preparation, the preparation is that present a bottleneck for the rest of the process. Uh, these bottleneck steps are uh, are clustered in an open path. Uh, it's run sequentially and we wanted to improve uh, using multi-threading. And about the center used in this work is we intended to validate the simulator using real world mobility patterns. And, and, and uh, regarding the low level approach, look at optimization of other functions and synchronization issues. Thank you. So thank you, Francisco, for your uh, presentation. Uh, so we are now opening for questions. Let me check the, the chat. 
uh, it seems no. Uh, I do have a question. Uh, I've worked with Alan for for some time, and uh, well, one of the reasons I let's say quit uh, using Erlang was its uh, low performance for uh, for doing especially numerical computations. We did some uh, experiments by combining C and uh, for doing the numerical part and uh, Erlang for the orchestration distribution, but uh, in the end, it, is, it seemed easier to, to employ MPI and so on. But uh, my, my question is uh, about the simulator. Uh, did, you, did you employ a similar approach? I mean, did you connect uh, Erlang process with other process or, every, was, or was everything implemented in Erlang? Uh, about the SimEDAP? Yeah. Uh... I, uh, we using all these ling uh, languages, uh, Python, Java, and the implementation of Simedap is in the, is um, out of the inter simulator is on process. It starts with, um, the previous simulations is on pre-processing using Simedap. Uh, after this uh, execution, the samples and distract the result of the inter simulators. We apply a SimEDAP to estimate the simulations and using Python and uh, Java language. Uh, this is uh, the inter the SimEDAP is not implemented in in Erlang, is in other language. Okay, so uh, I didn't get the point of Erlang in, in all this. Now this process, then, uh, in which part Erlang is used in the context of your project? Uh, Erlang is uh, implemented in, in the inter simulator previous uh, auto auto Eduardo Santana. This uh, work not using Erlang, uh, but Erlang uh, has uh, multi threading uh, based in actor, and you know, uh, so. Uh, using uh, social, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, the choice of Erlang was previous work is in, by Santana. And this work is we not um, uh, employment uh, Erlang, uh, Erlang fashion. So, the, so the, this work is, is to, to to level approach, uh, to level approach is different. Uh, on high level, SimEDAP uh, uh, is not uh, using Erlang. It is uh, low level approaches using using Erlang uh, optimizations uh, choose uh, choice um, implementing new new functions uh, using new implemented functions and and uh, built-in functions and. Different is uh, approaches in two level. Okay, okay, Francisco. Thanks a lot. Uh, congratulations on, on the work of you, on your work and the the work of your group. So I will now invite, uh, and uh, I will precede my invitation by saying sorry to to Maria Pantoja. Uh, because she was supposed to be the next one instead of Francisco, but uh, I, I messed up the, the order here. Uh, so I'd like to invite Maria Pantoja to present the work, a comparative study of consensus algorithms for distributed systems. Uh, together with Maria, we also have Kelsey Hadu Van Damme, Thomas Bronson Bergman, and Mohamed Al Aichuri. So, uh, Maria? Okay, good. Yeah. Sorry, Maria. And sorry again. Don't, don't even mention it. I have uh, I had a problem this morning uh, when I connected with the computer, so that's why I join a little bit uh, later. So you, you're fine. <laughs> There's no problem. Uh, let me see if I can share. Okay. Can everybody see the, the slides? 
Yes, okay. just need to put in presentation mode, yeah, if yeah. you don't mind. Yeah, no, of course. <laughs> okay, so now, um, okay, so my name is Maria Pantoja. And yeah, sorry, sorry, Maria, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. we are not seeing anything full oh. screen. I think it's... Uh, yeah, you have to share the... Uh, that's yeah, it. yes, that's one. Oh. The what? What do I have to do, sorry? You have to share the presentation screen or, or oh. because we, we are seeing the PPT. Oh, okay. So one second. The, okay, so I have to do this, I think. And then when I do... Can you see now the presentation? Yes, okay. perfect. Thank you. Sorry. And there is always... <laughs> okay, so starting again. Um, my name is Maria Pantoja. I, I teach in distributed system. And so I'm presenting in, in, the, in the name of my students, um, the comparative studies, uh, study of consensus algorithm. And um, can I advance? Okay, so, so the, the index is, first we are going to explain why, then give an introduction. The, and the consensus algorithms that we, did research was Paxos, RAF, and uh, a Byzantine um, fault, toler fault tolerance algorithm. Then we present the results and some conclusion. Um, the, the main, the problem statement, the reason why we actually wanted to do this is, is actually because we, I presented yesterday another uh, project uh, and we needed as part of the project to implement a consensus algorithm and we didn't know exactly which one is the better one to, to for our problem and there are actually many papers talking about consensus algorithms um, clearly there is a huge preference for Paxos is the oldest one it was Lampor so that's our goal so but but it's difficult to understand, difficult to read, difficult to implement, and there is no many details uh, about it. So everybody has a little bit of an idea of, um, or a simplification of, uh, of how to implement it. And definitely we wanted to be able to implement it with all the glory details and, and then do a fair comparison with our um, super faulty uh, cluster that we have in the university. And then also we had um, um, allocation on the through Exceed program in the Pittsburgh supercomputer. But the main purpose was like, um, which one is really better to implement uh, of these three? Uh, and which one provides the what we need uh, for uh, our specific problem? So, to talk about uh, consensus algorithm, they, they are, of course, they are the bread and they are the, at the core of every distributed system. Uh, they are, uh, they are like I said, distributed system are everywhere. It's not only high performance computing, even Amazon and so on, they have this, uh, this huge distributed system and everybody does consensus on a little bit on their own way. But there are three properties that consensus algorithm have uh, to accomplish. The first one, uh, so for the three of them are fault tolerance, lightness, and safety. Uh, fault tolerance basically means that uh, even if any of the nodes that are doing the computations fail, the system shouldn't go down. The computation should uh, keep going. Um, but even that, uh, that seems a very simple concept, it actually becomes a little bit more complicated when we actually talk about, but what is a fault, right? What do we mean by fault? Um, and there are the, the, most, uh, uh, the, the most common ones, uh, when we actually, when we talk about fault tolerance, we talk also about uh, Byzantine's problem that is the more generic of all the faults, right? And this problem, I know it's, most of you have heard about it, but uh, it's forced to talk a little bit about it. Uh, the Byzantine general problem is, uh, is coming from, um, imagine that an army gets into a city, uh, seeks a city, 
and they need and they place themselves, the different generals from the same ar army place themselves in different points around the city, uh, outside of the city, and uh, they need to agree on a time and a day to, to attack the city. If they all do it together, then they will succeed, succeed and conquer the city, but if they don't, they may, may fail. And the thing is that the generals, when they send the message, they say, oh, I'm ready to attack at this time. Then uh, the message may or may not arrive, arrive to the destination. And then also some of the generals can be actually traitors and say that they are going to attack at this time, but then they don't. Um, um, of course, in a distributed system, the generals are the nodes and they are not traitors, but they definitely can se send uh, faulty messages. Um, and, and then the problem is that can we, how do we prove that we actually have consensus among all the nodes, among all the generals? And so that's the, the fault tolerance. Uh, and Raft and Paxos actually are fault tolerance, but not to the Byzantine problem. So in that, in the sense that if the, um, they assume that the nodes, uh, when if they send the message, is not going to be a faulty message, it's going to be a true one. So they, they are not traitors. Uh, they may fail, uh, they may be slow at sending the, the message, and the message may never arrive, but when the message arrives, it's a true one. Um, so Raf and Paxos are not, um, they don't provide protection against Byzantine uh, failures, but uh, um, practical Byzantine fault tolerance does. Um, so that's the main difference between them, fault tolerance. They also have to accomplish liveness, which basically means they cannot take forever uh, to figure it out if, uh, if they need to attack, basically. But in, we, we don't need to attack, but we need to elect a leader, uh, figure it out who has the log to a file, and so on. Everything that, uh, that means that consensus is important. So the lightness means that they have to achieve consensus relatively quick and do and, 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 and move on, keep um, doing the calculation. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, no, I, I, I lost my, I talk a little bit. The safety, the safety feature is actually uh, assuming that uh, at least two of the, two thirds of the system uh, nodes are actually working that they, they are working, then they can actually uh, achieve a consensus uh, and safely move, move on. I'm going to skip. There is a lot of uh, tests in the, in the oh. um, my slides are messed up. I, I don't know what happened. I, I, I think my computer crashed and that's why I'm, I'm having this. So I'm going to try to explain, forget about the test. I don't know what is moving. Forget about the test. Uh, this is Paxos. This is the classical consensus algorithm. The way, ah, the way they achieve consensus is by actually in a two-phase um, two voting uh, system. So the nodes are divided between proposers and acceptors, and the proposer send the message. And it may be that two proposers send the message that they want to uh, to be the leader. They, they want to propose some action, right? They need to achieve their consensus. So these messages are being sent, and because it's a distributed system, and there may be a delay on the on the time where the acceptors receive the message. So, for example, in here, the acceptors do see the message from proposer A arriving first, but they actually see the proposer B arriving for, first on this one. And uh, the two phase is like, uh, well, the acceptors, when they, they see a message they, from the proposer, they say, okay, the first time they see the message, they, they, they send back to the proposer, uh, the, yeah, I'm ready to accept. I see your, basically saying, I see your proposer and I'm ready to accept. 
if the proposal receives a majority of those messages, then the proposal gets accepted and, and they move on. Um, but if they don't see a majority of messages, then, and then sometimes they don't see a majority of messages, the second attempt, I'm sorry. I don't know what is going on with my computer. But if they see, uh, they don't achieve majority, then the proposal is a little bit sneaky in the sense that it's going to drop the proposal because when they say, I cannot accept your proposal because I'm actually seeing somebody else with a higher value. So they drop the proposal, uh, uh, as adapt, accept the other, the, the proposal with the highest number and then send it again. Um, and this time, because it's, uh, and they, they send it to the majority of the node. And this time, because it's the proposal with the, for sure with the highest value, it gets accepted. Uh, hopefully it makes sense. Uh, it just, I have to do it a little bit. I, all the test is actually written in here. Um, but that's a very brief review of a very, very complex algorithm that is Paxos. It's so complex that there is uh, papers on simplifying Paxos and so on. But it does, uh, it, it does achieve all the three uh, properties. And like I said, it's been tested for many, many years. Um, and uh, we know for sure that it achieved consensus. Because Paxos is very difficult to implement, the details uh, are left uh, for the implementer. Then and there was this other paper is much more recently published. is uh, is called Raft, and it's based on Paxos, but uh, with more details, so it's easier to implement basically. And Raft is actually based on the R. In the paper, they give enough details, so it's, it's uh, it you basically is a recipe, so you can implement it much easier. Is based on on a heartbeat protocol, and I've seen the presenter two times, uh, two presenters ago actually explain that they implemented this algorithm also, or, or a simplification of it. But it did. Uh, it's very common to implement a heartbeat protocol, right? So the nodes send periodically the heartbeat to the neighbors and the neighbors, when they receive the heartbeat updates, yeah, I've seen this heartbeat. So that means my neighbors are alive. If they stop receiving this heartbeat for a certain amount of time, then they know uh, something is wrong. They know that uh, uh, the node is failing. Um, I have the graph in here. Usually, the raft is much, uh, it doesn't divide into acceptors in proposals. So, everybody can be the leader, basically. So, if any of the nodes uh, stop receiving the heartbeat, heartbeat of the, of the, uh, of the master, then it can actually become the, the proposal and send after with timeouts, it will send. It requires also a very nicely um, organized timeout. So every every node has their own individual uh, clock, and when the clock timeouts, that means they can send the proposal um, and to all the nodes in the system. And then if they receive a majority, then that node becomes the, the leader. It can be that uh, it can happen that two nodes time out at the same time. Uh, this doesn't happen in Paxos, um, but uh, if they both of them can actually become the leader, then they basically what RAF does is like it times them out. It gives them a, a random timer again, and uh, and they have to to send um, uh, again the proposal. Uh, so Ra what? sorry. I just don't know what is I, every time I get. Okay, so that is uh, in a nutshell rough. The the most interesting algorithm is I think is this one is the practical Byzantine fault tolerance because this one um, is uh, is um, consensus algorithm, but it's also tolerant to to the Byzantine um, Byzantine problem. The other two ones they didn't guarantee but Byzantine to, uh, fault tolerance. Uh, the, the thing is that um, 
to be basically to be able to um, guarantee Byzantine tolerance, that means that there have to be replicate messages. So it's not enough. Um, what they basically what it is is if it's not enough that I send a message and if I receive it, that's it, right? Uh, let's read whatever that proposal is. Um, in this uh, practical Byzantine uh, consensus algorithm, it, you don't only send one message, you send more than one. And the number of messages that you actually send, so, so you replicate the message. And if there is any difference between the message, then the, the receiver said, no, there is actually some problem with this uh, uh, node sending the message is not consistent. So it basically ignores the message. The number of, uh, of times that you need to send the message, it actually depends on the, the number of nodes in the system. And the formula for the, the, this algorithm is that it has to be the number of, at least the number of nodes minus one divided by three. So it does have a lot of, um, of overhead on sending message. So it basically it's, it achieves full tolerance Byzantine, but it's because it sends, it replicates the sex and the message several times. And, and I have here, a graph of what is going on. So it may be, uh, if I broadcast a message and it has to be received by all the nodes, but this one never received the node, ah, never received the node, then everybody sends the, the message back uh, to, through verification if it's actually replicated several times. It's also, it has also a, a second a two-phase algorithm but um, but it's basically the main thing is that it's going to send way way more messages. It replicates all of them. Um, I do have way more details. It's just I'm aware that in 15 minutes, even implement uh, explaining Paxos or RAF in in five minutes is actually very difficult to do. But if we have all the codes so with all the implementation details and so on that you can follow if you if you need to. Who you are interested on. Um, so we actually tested all the algorithm and we actually tested in our first we actually tested on like I said in our system and, and the results uh, here are actually published uh, are, are actually from our system um, and um, and you can see that it's, it's a little bit, it's Paxos. So if the number of nodes that are running the, the consensus algorithm is relatively small, they actually st they are actually more or less equal in, uh, in latency. But if the number of nodes start really growing, then the latency for um, the practical Byzantine becomes, uh, it really is the growth of uh, on latency becomes almost exponential as the number of nodes increases, uh, while Paxos and RAF more or less um, behave, uh, behave linear, the growth is linear, the latency is linear. RAF um, performs a little bit better, uh, it has less latency than Paxos. It may be our implementation, like I said, Paxos has papers that explain it and the simplification and so on. So it may be that the way we we implemented um, uh, it it uh, triggers um, that RAF actually does better, but the, it actually is very the different is very small. So basically the same, but definitely we saw that exponential growth on on the practical Byzantine. Um, so yeah, it's very full tolerance, but the latency may may actually kill you. <laughs> uh, this is actually just a, a graph to show the execution time uh, with the number of nodes. So we actually we we run the consensus algorithm with actually our matrix multiplication, um, and our nodes were going up and down all the time. So. Uh, so this graph is just to show that we were actually getting the, um, the execution time actually was improving when we actually get uh, nodes. So the consensus, 
consensus algorithm didn't affect the execution time um, that much, uh, right? It, uh, certainly, there is always going to be an overhead, but we were able to calculate, and the more number of nodes, we actually uh, do better. Um, I don't know what this slide is, why the test is so big suddenly, but this is uh, the conclusion is we we actually implemented the three algorithm. Let me actually show you this one, so it's better to the eyes. So we actually implemented the three algorithms. The implementation is actually in GitHub, so you can actually uh, get them and replicate our experiments on our on your own system. We actually use Go uh, programming language um, because it's actually very easy, relatively easy uh, to teach a student. It has a very soft uh, learning curve, uh, so they can learn the algorithm and the programming language almost at the same time. Um, so that's why it's implemented in Go. Um, it's also very easy to write distributed application on, on Go. And uh, yeah, all the, all of them are in here. So do you, and this is the end of the presentation. Sorry, I got a little bit anxious because of the slides were moving and, and so on. But um, do you have any, any question? Thank you, Maria, for your presentation. Uh, let me check in the chat if you have any questions. In fact, uh, in fact we are uh, a bit uh, behind the schedule, but uh, I think we have uh, space for one question. Uh, no, it seems, it seems not. Uh, I, I was uh, actually... Uh, uh, curious about uh, uh, the way you've uh, uh, implemented, but your final <laughs> sentence just replied me which language you used to to to, de to develop these codes. Uh, I tried to take a look. Uh, I managed to copy only the first one, which is from Paxos. The, the other ones I, I couldn't be fast enough to to copy the URL. But uh, uh, it seems uh, offline, perhaps, uh, if you could uh, check afterwards. Uh, the links? Yes. Uh, by the way, there is a question just arrived from Esteban Moxus. Uh, can you explain a little more about how you tested the, the algorithms? Uh, yes, we actually, the, we have um, our own uh, cluster in the lab. And what we were doing is like, okay, so let's do a lot of computation. And we do have um, 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 our hello world to test or everything we do is uh, a matrix matrix multiplication algorithm, um, a, a distributed one, right? Um, and we do have it also implemented in Go. We lately we use Go for everything. The students like it more. So what we do is we start running the the Go routines. Uh, sorry, no. Where we start is uh, start the program with the matrix multiplication, and and we let it go right. And then um, and at the same time. When we actually, okay, so let me give you the detail. When we actually run the matrix multiplication, we also say what are the nodes that are available on the system, right, to run. And, and then because Go will actually, we have a library also for that, we'll grab whatever nodes that are available to run uh, as distributed, then it starts a computation. Usually our lab is so bad that we actually have failures, uh, even if we don't inject uh, any failure on the nodes. But uh, for this test, because we were actually, we wanted to see the consensus running, we will periodically kill the master. And, uh, and then we test uh, if we achieve consensus on the master. So we have the, the graph with the, um, uh, with the bars, it's just the latency of the consensus. And then we actually have, uh, if the program is running and we have failure, do we actually still see uh, a speed up 
uh, as we should, right? So it doesn't uh, affect the, the consensus algorithm doesn't affect the, the distribution, the um, speed up of the code, sorry. Thank you, Maria, for your presentation. Uh, so I'll just pass to our last uh, presenter, uh, which will be Mariela Abdala. She's going to present uh, the paper Understanding COVID-19 Epidemic in Costa Rica Through Network-Based Modeling. Uh, the authors are uh, Mariela, Cristina Soto, Me Melissa Arce, Eduardo Cruz, João, João Maciel, uh, Camila Closato, and Esteban Menezes. Mariela, when you are ready, great. So the floor is yours. Uh, is everything okay with my screen? Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to start uh, right away. Um, so why do we model epidemics? Uh, first, let me tell you a little bit about the pandemic in Costa Rica. Uh, the first case of COVID-19 was reported in March 6, 2020. And since the beginning, the government has been implementing different uh, sanitary measures for non-pharmaceuticals such as social gatherings, school closures, non-essential services closure, to pharmaceutical solutions such as vaccination. And the purpose of all these measures is to decrease uh, transmission and its consequences, given that it's very easy to spread COVID-19 and we all understand the outcomes of letting that happen. But how do we know that these measures are effective and how effective they are before we try them. We need some kind of tool uh, to evaluate that because all this is not only affect the number of cases and support the health system, but they also uh, have an impact in economy, education, mental health, and other, and other areas. So it is fundamental for the governments to make good decisions on this matter. Fortunately, epidemic modeling and simulations are powerful tools to give some criteria about the efficacy of public policies. We have a model, we can simulate it, and we can see uh, how a disease spreads in a certain population over time. And if we modify some parameters, we could simulate things like lockdown, the application of a vaccine, and other interventions. Network models in particular uh, use a graph to represent how people are connected in a more realistic manner. Uh, every node is a person and the disease spreads between contexts. Uh, every edge has an infection probability and this probability depends on the relation type between these two nodes, their infected state and the R0 value, which is the number of secondary cases per one contagious case. And what we do is to evaluate the probability versus a random probability. And that's how we decide if someone will get infected or not. Uh, why making a study of Costa Rica? Uh, because we identify three important containment policies that have been highly discussed. Uh, these are the vaccination campaign, the schools reopening, and the restrictions on social events. And we need an accurate model for COVID-19 in this particular context, because demography, geography, and even society are different for every country. Also, there are other research groups that have been uh, working on models of COVID-19 for Costa Rica, but as far as we know, there are no specific uh, scenario studies like the ones we present. Uh, we use a COVID-19 simulation framework uh, called Corona++. Uh, it was written in C++ and implemented by our collaborators in Brazil. Uh, the platform uses a modified CER model, which stands for uh, susceptible exposed infected are recovered. And the dynamics is the following. We are healthy or susceptible uh, then we get exposed to the barriers and start incubating. Uh, we might be asymptomatic or presymptomatic, which means that I'm infectious, but uh, haven't developed any symptoms yet. 
Later, we get mild symptoms that may evolve to severe or critical cases, and these cases uh, could uh, um, transition to the deceased state or eventually recover. If we vaccinate someone, this person goes straight from the healthy compartment to the immune state. <clears throat> so every individual is categorized in one of these compartments and they transition from one to another over time, depending on the um, probability of each state. The simulator also uses a population graph. In the case of Costa Rica, uh, we simulate 5 million nodes, each one assigned to one of 81 regions or cantons. Uh, the connection types that we have are family, work, school, considering the students and teachers, and random relations. The data requirements are high. Uh, we need population data, age and region segre seg segregated, sorry, and <clears throat> uh, mobility data uh, between the main cities, uh, and other information about the health and education systems, such as mortality, hospitalizations, uh, the number and size of schools. We need occupation and social data, such as the number of people in a workplace. And as you may have noticed, some of these parameters are not unique. Uh, for example, the number of students inside a school. Uh, so we use distributions uh, to define them, and this makes the model stochastic. We executed our simulations on Intel Xeon processors, uh, 36 cores, uh, 3 gigahertz. Uh, these are part of the Cabrera supercomputer uh, of the National High Technology Center in Costa Rica. Uh, we performed 3,000 repetitions that took about uh, 14 hours of computation time. The way we calibrate the model is by adjusting the R0 value. And the goal is to match the actual reported cases with the cure obtained by calculating the median of all 3,000 uh, repetitions. And as you can see, the model fit is good for the most important variables, the infected or reported and the deceased. We compared the recovered too, but this is not so valuable because uh, in reality, the recovered cases are being reported behind time and the model doesn't consider that. Uh, we, may, we might be getting even more precise results because the model reports as soon as people recover. <clears throat> Once we have the model, we analyze the first uh, strategy. Uh, in Costa Rica, the vaccination has been irregular in the amount of people uh, immunized per day since the beginning, which is this uh, dash line that you see here. Uh, so we decided to analyze two scenarios with constant vaccination. One where we vaccinate a moderate uh, daily amount of 5,000 people and another where we have uh, one of the highest vaccination rates worldwide, which is uh, 100,000 people. Uh, the blue line represents uh, the actual situation. And what we see is, this, is that constant vaccination will have a positive impact uh, in the reduction of cases. No matter if it's moderate or exhaustive, of course, uh, the second case will be even more positive, but the relevant result here is that we, will ha we would have a decrease of 14% to 45% uh, in cases. The second uh, policy is the uh, schools reopening. People are concerned about the quality of education. Um, <clears throat> some students don't have uh, access to virtual resources. At the time we performed this study, uh, the schools in Costa Rica were partially closed. So we wanted to study what would happen if we reopened the schools with the 100% of students. Uh, that means turning on all the school uh, relations in the graph. Um, as children tend to be less careful or less aware, uh, we stated two scenarios. One where there is a high observance of the sanitary practices, so the, uh, the 
uh, intraschool transmission is regular. And another where the observance is poor, so the transmission is high. And the results are that reopening the schools with 100% of students would increase the cases by 33% to 46%. The last inter intervention is the restriction on social events. Uh, as people have shown reluctance to follow the directives, we wanted to, to see what would happen if the government allows people to gather uh, for two weeks. So there are two uh, dash lines. We have two types of social events, small gatherings with family and friends and massive events. And uh, uh, what we find is that uh, they are pretty similar in the amount of extra cases that they cause. Uh, that's about 24% more. But um, actually, small gatherings are even more harmful because uh, people tend to be less cautious when they are among their acquaintances uh, as in familiar meetings than when they are uh, with strangers uh, as in a massive event. So uh, when modeling, we gave more weight to the uh, first relations. So in conclusion, we managed to build an accurate model to represent uh, COVID-19 propagation dynamics in Costa Rica. Uh, with our simulations, we determined that custom vaccination, no matter uh, if it's uh, exhaustive or moderate, uh, would cause a decrease in reported cases. Uh, we find that reopening the schools and allowing social events would increase the number of cases and obviously deaths. And we believe that this study can be extended to other countries and to simulate other variants or even diseases. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot for, for your presentation uh, and for being strict to the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'd uh, like to, to open to, to questions from the audience. We, we work here at LNCC with uh, this sort of uh, epidemiological models as well. Uh, but uh, uh, instead of uh, stochastic models, we use uh, uh, deterministic models. We use uh, ordinary differential equations to, to represent the evolution of, uh, of the cases. Uh, I got from your presentation that uh, you use uh, a stochastic model. Uh, uh, I see your work as quite complete because you, you manage to, to integrate various levels of, uh, uh, of modeling. And I, I wonder whether uh, using a deterministic uh, uh, modeling would help uh, to, to achieve a better accuracy or uh, to give a different perspective from from the results that you get, if you could comment a bit on this. Well, uh, well, I'm not uh, an epidemiologist, but I think that um, deterministic models are uh, good for a general study of the of an epidemic. Uh, stochastic models are, are more uh, complex, but they represent uh, in a better way the uh, real situation because uh, uh, the, the phenomenon in reality is a stochastic, right? So we, yeah. we would think about uh, a stochastic model. It would be interesting to, to see the results with, uh, with a deterministic model, but uh, uh, honestly, I, I wouldn't say uh, uh, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't guess uh, anything because, because yeah. I haven't worked with those models, only mm -hmm. with this one. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not to contrast one model against another. It's, they can be complementary. They can be Lovely. run together and they can help you in reducing, uh, eventually reducing the, the uncertainty that mm -hmm. you have this sort of, uh, of simulations. But let me stop talking because there are some questions. There is one question in the audience, from the audience. Uh, it's from, I, I can see there, uh, Georgina. It's from Georgina 
and she's asking in what language were the simulations uh, implemented? Uh, well, we use a, um, an already implemented simulator. Uh, it is um, in C++. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. Uh, if your group is interested, we can exchange some uh, uh, some information about these different models. I think it would be quite interesting. For instance, for giving you access to data from Brazil or or the opposite, and we could compare the models. I think it would be a, a nice thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, well, I, I can't see <laughs> data is always all welcome. Esteban says. <laughs> sure. Uh, so I think we don't have any any more questions, uh, and we are managing to to finish our our last session in perfect timing. So I'd like to uh, say thank you to Mariela and to all the other presenters and authors who have been presenting their works here at uh, at Carla. So. This is it. I don't know whether there is any other one from uh, the organization that would like to say something. <laughs>